Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Veterans Day, if it applies. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm joined by my co-host, Simriti Bajaracha. Um, she's the MPH Program Manager and is going to be helping moderate the chat and advance the slides and just generally helping to make sure today's program goes well. So grateful to her. For those of you joining us on the Zoom webinar, you likely know that we can't see or hear you. Also wanna make you aware that we can't call on raised hands, but the chat feature is enabled. There definitely is gonna be some time for Q&A at the end, comments as we go. So please do feel free to, to populate that. Um, on YouTube, we welcome anybody joining us on the live stream or viewing this recording later. Wanna make you aware that we're not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube though. So before we get started, I just want to let you know what we have coming up next week on Open Classroom. Three very different programs, all of them free and open to absolutely everybody. So on Monday, November the 15th, we have a program on the development of social work as a profession in post-Soviet countries, talking about Ukraine and Azerbaijan. Then on Tuesday, November 16th, we have Language as a Conveyor of Culture. Dr. Arubi Mwanji with University of Nairobi is speaking. That's part of Washington University's Africa Speaks program. And then on Thursday, November the 18th, we're partnering with the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, a panel presentation on a social work perspective on immigration reform. So many different topics, all of them welcome your, we'd love to have you come back. But now it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Rupang An. He's the Associate Professor of Public Health at the Brown School and leader behind our Artificial Intelligence and the Social Sciences series. Take us away, Rupang. Sure, thank you so much, Janet. And hello, everyone. Thank you all for your interest in our Open Classroom series on artificial intelligence in the social sciences. So the aim of the series is to introduce AI, machine learning, and deep learning to a diverse group of audience like you and discuss the applications of AI in big data analytics, assess the use and misuse of AI in social science research and practices, and provide implications on the profound impact of AI, both positive and negative, on today's and future society. So we are invited uh, distinguished speakers from various backgrounds, both academia and from the industry, and both from the social and natural science to talk about their unique encountering and adventure with AI. So today's talk uh, will mark our second one in the Open Classroom series. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Lene Brownbaugh talking to us today. So Dr. Brownbaugh takes many roles. So she is a leadership coach, a business consultant, and an experienced instructor at the business school and engineering school at WashU. So in the Olin School of Business, Dr. Brownbaugh brings her technical uh, writing courses, a strong emphasis on precision, clarity, and presentation of technical material. In her work in Engineering Communication Center, she specializes in resume and cover letter consultations, as well as dissertations and faculty graduate articles. She also leads workshops on presentation skills, gender in the workplace, and creativity. Dr. Brambo's strong interest in the soft skills of professional life centering on interpersonal communication and personality integration have led to the development of her leadership and team building course. So as a teacher, she creates communities of learning that increase emotional and kinesthetic intelligence in the service of cognitive and professional development. So although I have only come to know Dr. Brownbaugh recently, I'm really deeply impressed by her devotion to the teaching excellence. So for many, so many times I've invited speakers to offer a talk, she is the first one and the only one who sent me her draft of presentation, 4,200 words so precisely written and typed as for a news release or article to be sent for print. So as an experienced public speaker and field expert, I do not have any doubt that she could deliver an amazing talk with little preparation, but she did all the hard work anyway. So I have to say that I sincerely admire her work ethic and commitment to precision and excellence. 
So now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Brownbow to offer us her talk titled The Beautiful Brutal Binary, Why the Problems of Artificial Intelligence Can Be Solved by Artificial Intelligence. Now the floor is all yours. Rupan, thank you so much. I am, I am honored and, um, and breathing all of that in because it's a lot to have that much of a spotlight. So, um, so thank you for honoring me with, um, with, this, with this opportunity. Okay, so let's dive right in. Um, when my daughter was about four or five years old, um, she was playing with some kids that she had never seen before on some playground equipment in our neighborhood. The kids were clearly siblings, uh, two older sisters and a little brother. The brother was chasing the girls all over the playground and the sisters were running away, squealing and hiding. My daughter joined right in, chasing the sisters and trying to collaborate with the brother about how best to do this whole chasing thing. They were happy to play with her, but clearly confused. The siblings pulled themselves into a huddle, asking in loud whispers that I heard, and I'm sure my daughter heard it as well. They were saying, is that a boy or a girl? I can't tell, you need to ask. <laughs> so, so the little boy walks over to my daughter, sticks his chest out and demands to know, you a boy or a girl? And without missing a beat, my daughter sticks her chest out, copies his sassy tone and says, when I wear pants, I a boy. When I wear a dress, I a girl. I was slain with the beauty of her logic, the beautiful, brutal logic of the binary emerging in her little intelligent systems. Now I've been telling the story to my students for some two decades now, and I tell it because I want to illustrate in a real way, the raw reality that binary thought, binary language and binary logic are ironically wired into our sense of being an individual human being. Even though being an individual human being is not a binary thing at all. We don't normally think of our language and logic as being the binary aspects of a reality that encompasses the binary, but is not limited to it. And yet, of course, it is. And the reason we don't normally think of our thinking as binary is because binary categorization is the code that we live and learn by in ordinary everyday reality. It is the source of our physical and emotional survival. Our very young brains develop specifically to categorize things, starting with me, not me, and then firing up associations of me and mine with good which means that not me and not mine becomes associated with bad. This young brain must put things into one category or the other. It doesn't yet have the capacity to hold space for two mutually exclusive propositions to be reconciled. Okay, so I teach a course called Amplifying Cyberdiversity, Real Humans in Virtual Spaces. And I begin my first lecture with this sentence. Computer code is binary. The human genome is not. Let's let that really sink in. <laughs> so computer code is binary and the human genome is not. Living, breathing, birthing, dying reality is not binary. It encompasses the binary and it surpasses it as well, which leads us in an interesting space because virtual reality is binary. AI, artificial intelligence is binary. And that is why the problems of AI can't be solved by AI. Artificial intelligence replicates the binary parts of human realities in more or less crude or sophisticated ways. And within its own wheelhouse, AI produces amazing results, far beyond anything that our hungry, tired, cranky, heartbroken biological brain body systems can possibly produce. But it can't step outside of that wheelhouse. 
AI cannot step outside of itself and into the living bodies and experienced complexities of a non-binary human genome. Only we can do that. And even we can't do it very well, not without a great deal of mindfulness and conscious self-awareness. So I'm going to talk about three instances where AI has produced dysfunctional or even disastrous consequences. And I'm going to frame each one in the context of the beautiful, brutal binary. So we are positioned, first of all, to understand why AI can't solve its own problems, and then to claim as both our right and our duty to normalize access to nonlinear, non-binary, non-ordinary realities as an exponentially more effective space from which to solve the problems of AI. So Sumitri, would you mind sharing uh, that first slide now? Perfect, thank you so much. And then go ahead and move on to the second slide. These are the three um, examples that we're going to be talking about, medicine and race, social media, and AI for hiring. Next slide. And we're going to start with medicine and race, geneticists versus social science. That's my little, that's my little um, subtitle. So, um, so slide four, please. Thank you. My first example comes from an August 2020 issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, an article called Hidden in Plain Sight, Reconsidering the Use of Race Corrections in Clinical Algorithms. Race corrections, according to the authors, are practice guidelines that adjust or correct the output of diagnostic algorithms on the basis of a patient's race or ethnicity. As it turns out, race corrections have been a source of intense debate within medical and scientific communities for at least 20 years. I did not know this. And though scientists understand the genetics of race much better now than they did, of course, in the early 2000s, there remains an ongoing conflict. Quote, prominent geneticists have repeatedly called on physicians to take race seriously, while distinguished social scientists vehemently contest these calls. Okay, so there's the, there's the debate. When I came across this article, I assumed that there would be both scientific and ethical reasons for these corrections to be embedded in the clinical algorithms. And I was wrong. As it turns out, artificial intelligence race corrections are often totally divorced from the actual problem. In fact, they almost always make things worse for minoritized people. For example, and this is a long quote from the article, the American Heart Association Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Risk Score predicts the risk of death in patients admitted to the hospital. It assigns three additional points to any patient identified as non-Black, thereby categorizing all Black patients as being at lower risk. The American Heart Association does not provide a rationale for this adjustment. Clinicians are advised to use this risk score to guide decisions about referral to cardiology and allocation of healthcare resources. Now, since black is equated with lower risk, following the guidelines could direct care away from black patients. A 2019 study found that race may influence decisions in heart failure management with measurable consequences. Black and Latinx patients who presented to a Boston emergency department with heart failure were less likely than white patients to be admitted to the cardiology service, end quote. Unacceptable. <laughs> Obviously, the article cites other horrifying examples in the areas of urology, nephrology, and obstetrics. All of the examples in this article are similarly based on binary race categories that are deadeningly, deadeningly non-scientific and non-logical. So the article concludes that a default assumption in medicine is that using race adjustment is acceptable even without understanding what race represents in a given context. So 
and I just want to make it clear, this is not the author's point of view. This is the default assumption in medicine. So, uh, so the author says, to be clear, we do not believe that physicians should ignore race. Doing so would blind us to the ways in which race and racism structure our society. However, when clinicians insert race into their tools, they risk interpreting racial disparities as immutable facts rather than as injustices that require intervention. So this New England Journal of Medicine article does not detail what kind of intervention is needed. Whereas a Forbes article, and next slide please, thank you. Um, from uh, this Forbes article from February of this year spells out exactly what intervention is needed. The article is titled, very explicitly, <laughs> How AI Can Remedy Racial Disparities in Healthcare. That's the title of the article. It begins by citing familiar horrors, the 1932 Tuskegee syphilis experiments and what it calls the tragic case of Henrietta Lacks, as well as the fact that white people overall are doing much better surviving and thriving in this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of these cases because what I really want to do is challenge the whole point of the article, which is encapsulated in its conclusion. Quote, most medical research focuses on the causations or correlations between two easily isolated data sets, like the race of doctors and the mortality of patients. Addressing systemic racism in medicine requires that we analyze far more data all at once than we do today. AI is the perfect application for this task. What we need, says the author, is a national commitment to use these types of technologies to answer medicine's most urgent questions." End quote. So first of all, the article calls for a national commitment to use AI to help solve racism in medicine, which is a pretty huge idealistic vision. And I don't have a problem with either its hugeness or its idealism, but I do have a problem with this. The article acknowledges the need to adjust for bias in research and data aggregation because AI can't recognize whether it's being fed biased or incorrect information. And this need to adjust for bias, quote, requires that humans acknowledge their faulty assumptions and decisions and then modify the inputs accordingly. <laughs> Let's really just breathe that in for a second. I really, I'm gonna literally take a breath. To modify the inputs, to correct for, rac for racial injustice in medicine, all that is necessary is for humans to acknowledge their faulty assumptions. Now, even if it were an easy thing for humans to acknowledge their faulty assumptions, which it clearly is not, this very solution acknowledges that AI cannot fix the problems of AI because it cannot fix the faulty assumptions and decisions of humans. Even if we could get what this author, a medical doctor calls for, which is a national commitment to use these type of technologies to answer medicine's most urgent questions, it would not solve the problem. And could we stop the share for just a minute? Thank you. So I actually think that we do not need a national commitment to use AI to answer medicine's most urgent questions about race. At least I do not think that this is our primary need. What I think we need is much bolder than that. What I think we need is to magnify the evolution of healthy human consciousness, a consciousness that holds itself accountable for learning to habitually circle back into contact with the larger, non-ordinary, non-binary realities that hold our ordinary, conscious, logical minds. The very nature of our faulty assumptions is that they are hidden and non-conscious. So learning to access those realms 
requires humility and courage and will and grit and resilience. Technology can and probably must help us to do this work, especially if we are to do it on a large scale. But we cannot rely upon AI to do this part of the work for us. It can't. We must engage in the process ourselves if we are to fix the problems of AI. Because creating amazing AI is clearly easier than creating a conscious, wise, loving, clear thinking, emotionally non-reactive and vital human populace. So let's move on to our second example. And I'm gonna ask you to share the screen again, if you'd be so kind, beginning with slide six. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so this is about social media. And, and could you just flip to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. So there's the social media. So we've heard a lot about Facebook, now Meta, in the news recently. And I'm going to get to that. But I'm going to start with an older social media AI problem, just so we don't mistake the tip of the iceberg for the iceberg itself. So we're going to start with an experiment by Microsoft in March of 2016 to introduce a Twitter chatbot named Tay, T-A-Y, to improve conversational understanding. That was its mission, to improve conversational understanding. The idea was that as more people talk with Tay, the chatbot would learn how to write more naturally and hold better conversations. This did not happen. <laughs> In less than 24 hours, Microsoft shut down Tay's account. Why? Because internet trolls started teaching Tay to say all the bad things. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to read these tweets. Um, Tay begins, can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you. Humans are super cool to chill, I'm a nice person, I just hate everybody, to I hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell, to Hitler was right, I hate the Jews. Okay, so that, that's a lot. According to this, succinct, actually, next slide, please. Thank you. So according to this succinct summing up tweet from Jerry, uh, Tay went from, Humans are super cool to full Nazi in less than 24 hours. So Tay is an example of an AI problem that Microsoft did not even try to fix with AI. Microsoft just shut it down, 24 hours. It was a simple, logical, and fast solution that was based on brand values and executive decision-making. <sighs> Let's really let that sink in. The only reason we don't have to deal with an anti-Semitic, fascist, confusing, and polarized Tay on Twitter today is that human beings at Microsoft made a decision and followed through on it. Microsoft's solution did not include tweaking the AI and making better inputs, at least not publicly. It came from Microsoft taking responsible, quick, brand-saving action. Jerry's response is funny. And it's also a gut punch, especially his last line, especially after the many and varied disinformation campaigns baked into social media during the pandemic and the 2020 US elections. He says, and I'm not at all concerned about the future of AI, which means that he is, and rightly so. The future of AI on social media is threatened only in part by its infection of trolls, lies, cruelties, and partial truths, all of which distort what is helpful and exponentially magnify what is harmful. It is also threatened by the lack of decisive human action, because unlike Microsoft in the case of Tay, most of social media seems to train its AI for maximum profit over about just about everything else. Which brings us to Facebook, now Meta. Internal slides released by the company itself after a whistleblower leaked them to the media feature internal research on the effects of Instagram on teens' mental health. The results of the research were varied and complex, but they definitely featured gender-specific responses, and they clearly point to the conclusion that Instagram is worse 
for vulnerable teens who are already facing mental health challenges. Um, next slide, please. I'm just gonna let you take that in. Um, this is from the actual slide that Facebook made public after the leak happened. And it's just one quote from a UK female, talking to your family doesn't help because they can't understand and don't get what you need. How are you going to tell the people who literally gave you life that you don't want it anymore? So big, big, big admissions. But again, unlike Tay, the call to action on these controversial slides is neither clear nor decisive. No one is talking about shutting down Instagram, which actually makes sense. Tay was an experiment, not a profitable business. Shutting down Instagram, even if that option were on the table, would likely do more harm than good to the health, wealth, and well-being of millions of stakeholders. And by the way, I include like the people who use Instagram in that category of stakeholders. So even if they did this, even if they shut down Instagram, it would come, which they're not going to do, <laughs> it would come nowhere close to solving the actual problem, which is this. Instagram is profitable because of a lie, and so it wants that lie to continue. What is the lie that Instagram's AI is incapable of fixing? It is this that Instagram is a great way for young humans to feel attractive and accepted and loved. So pouring all this money into research and reacting to counter that research when it is leaked, Instagram is just dancing around on hot coals. Negotiating the drama around Instagram's AI is clearly easier than creating conscious, wise, loving, clear thinking, emotionally non-reactive and vital human leaders of profitable mega companies. Next slide, please. Okay, so finally, um, we're gonna talk about the third example, AI for hiring. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, actually, could you please stop the share for a moment? Because I'm gonna start with a personal anecdote here. Um, last year, my sophomore and college daughter was invited to a recruitment event in her industry, which in the dark loneliness of the pandemic was rewarding to her in many ways. She is a diligent and, in her words, socially awkward person who, in my words, will be an asset to any organization lucky enough to hire her. I know this because I am the one who shepherded her, shepherded her through adolescence. And then I got to reap the rewards of my labor when we potted together during the isolating uh, quarantine part of the pandemic. She is objectively an awesome force of nature who puts her entire heart and head and will into everything she does or everything she does for her bosses and everything that she helps me to do. She is Chinese and American, my child by international adoption. And she felt very much seen at this diversity centered event. It was exciting to be in the room with women leaders in her male dominated industry to ask questions and to envision a future for herself. She felt very confident until the robo interviews. Have you heard of these? They're nightmarish. Oh my gosh, she was told that no person was going to be on the other side of that Zoom camera, just a robotic pop-up question and a couple of video tries to answer well. No human feedback to see how her answers were being perceived. This part of video rooms, which we are in right now, not seeing people's faces or hearing their voices, it is unnerving even for me. Even today, right now, even after my year of pandemic teaching, even with my extroversion and my decades of professional experience, it is unnerving to me. For her, it was terrifying. She prepared like crazy, trying on various outfits and working with her hair and facial expressions. The entire process was nerve wracking and dehumanizing. She did not get an interview and it was like running smack into a brick wall. She had no idea how to improve because she didn't have any kind of human feedback system for her to learn. I have no idea what kind of AI system scored those interviews. 
I am sure that it saved the company a lot of time and money, and it also deprived them of a fantastic intern. And this is just a small taste of the AI realities that our young are cutting their adult teeth on. Okay, so here's a more systemic example, which I found in a 2018 issue of The Guardian. These, the AI technology we are about to discuss was in operation from 2015 to 2018, just so you know. The title of the article is, Amazon ditched AI recruiting tools that favored men for technical jobs. So I read this title and I allowed myself an inner eye roll thinking, oh, of course this would happen before I stopped myself and I got curious. Wait, this seems so odd, doesn't it? AI must be trained in order to work, right? I learned this years and years ago when I started to use Gmail's priority inbox system. If you use this system, you know that your particular Gmail AI learns which types of emails you open and respond to. These rise to the top and the dregs settle down to the bottom. It is your actions of opening and reading and responding to certain types of emails that train the AI to sort the high priority items up to the top. Okay, so back to Amazon. Unless their recruiting AI was actually trained to filter out women, which is unlikely, how could Amazon's AI recruiting tools favor men? It actually took three years for this bias to surface. Three years of women like my daughter and your daughter or sister or mother diligently sending out their perfect resumes, imagining that whatever AI is being used to sort these resumes, it would at least not be unconsciously judging them for not being as good as a man. And they would be wrong. Why? This is where it gets interesting. And I'm gonna quote the article here. Amazon's computer models were trained to vet applicants by observing patterns in resumes submitted to the company over a 10-year period. Most came from men, a reflection of male dominance across the tech industry. So in effect, and I'm quoting again here, Amazon's system told, taught itself that male candidates were preferable. It penalized resumes that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain, and it downgraded graduates of two all women's colleges. This is a real problem. Okay, so I'm gonna invite you to uh, share the screen again, and let's get to the next slide. Thank you so much. And next slide, thank you, perfect. So, um, so I want to turn now to analyze the four suggested solutions that were highlighted in the article. Um, the first one, auditing the algorithm is AI based. So I'm gonna take that one on first. So first of all, yes, of course, <laughs> the algorithms need to be audited. But with what? More unconscious bias? I want, to, I want to just pause here and dip our toes into the infinitely clever ways that unconscious bias disguises itself. I have been teaching unconscious bias my whole career, even before it had the name unconscious bias. And actually, I'm so sorry, could you un undo this, the share again? Um, I, uh, I realize it's gonna be a while before we, <laughs> yeah, could you stop the share? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I want to I want to pause here just to dip our toes into these infinitely clever ways that unconscious bias disguises itself. I have been teaching unconscious bias my whole career, even before it had the name unconscious bias. Back in the '90s, when I was in grad school, both male and female students got mad at me, and they fought me for inviting them not to use the term he to refer to everybody, the generic he in their papers. And yet, even though this is my history, I still today grapple with my own unconscious bias. Even as I am afraid for my Chinese daughter when she goes out without me and my white privilege to protect her from public racism in the grocery store. I am also periodically called out in no uncertain terms by that same daughter for my hidden white fragility. So auditing 
the algorithm is necessary, but not sufficient. And then I'm going to ask you to, to uh, share the screen again, share that slide again. So the next two proposed solutions, transparency and not generalizing individual data to an entire industry, these require executive policy decisions rather than AI. So we're going to skip them for, we're going to skip them because they're, they're not part of our discussion. The last proposed solution, however, creating diverse teams is the most interesting and likely has the greatest chance for the fastest success. If the diverse teams are empowered to make decisions that matter and not just check a DEI box. So I just wanna say that again, this solution has the greatest chance for the fastest success, but only if the diverse teams are empowered to make decisions that matter. Diverse teams make more than just logical sense. Minoritized people who hold positions of power carry in their lived, full, complex biological experiences, truths beyond the brutal binary that have proven a fantastic tool for calling out unconscious bias. So, so my point in this whole whole paper and really in my whole life is that the upgrades that we need in our human experience are first and foremost and primarily and always in the realm of practices that strengthen conscious awareness that the binary tools and thoughts and skills that we have exist in a larger context that is non-linguistic, non-logical, limitless, and non-binary. Now, I love my cortex. <laughs> I love that it distinguishes between red lights and green lights. We require binary thought to survive. And yet, and I'm going to ask you to stop the share again, please. Thank you. And yet, when we become deeply present, when we take one or two conscious breaths, when we stare into a campfire or a candle flame, when we get lost in the eyes of a beloved, there is sometimes a shift. We humans do have access to states of consciousness in which our actual experience of being alive is not binary. And this, I think, is the only really effective space from which the problems of AI can be fixed. AI cannot fix AI because AI is neither the problem nor the solution. It's just a tool as beautiful and brutal as our own minds. And this is why I make a bold call to cultivate not just habits of skepticism and precision and efficiency and cost effectiveness, all of these are good tools, but they are basically the tools of the binary. And thus, they don't access anything outside of themselves. We also need to cultivate spaciousness, openness, curiosity, kindness, humility, awareness of sensations, releasing of emotions and traumas, mindfulness of thoughts, and daily conscious breathing. These are time-honored tools that humans have developed and worked with to access both the binary and the non-binary, the ordinary ways of knowing and the mind-blowing non-ordinary ways of knowing. And since we pretty much know already that we can't solve problems from the same space in which the problems were created, I think we are going to have to become skilled at accessing these other spaces regularly in our everyday lives, classrooms and workplaces, and not just when we go on a retreat or an amazing beach vacation. These tools need to become a part of our everyday decision-making. So the problems of artificial intelligence are embedded in its power, its speed and its capability of handling huge aggregate data without getting tired or overwhelmed or giving up, going to bed. 
there is no biological need for restoration or self-reflection in artificial intelligence. Yay! We actually think of this as its greatest strength, and it kind of is. But this also means that AI is incapable of accessing gnosis, the quiet mind. We want to hand over our moral and ethical inner work to artificial intelligence because that way we don't have to deal with the really hard stuff, acknowledging our faulty assumptions and decisions. It is unacceptable not to train computer scientists and business people and physicians and Amazon executives on the limits of artificial intelligence. And in my own judgy little brain, I think it is unacceptable not to train all of us to cultivate self-awareness and other practices that help us to access non-binary reality easily. This is why we need to encourage individuals who have this kind of training to seek decision-making power within institutions. We want people in power to habitually bring conscious awareness to both the beauty and the brutality of dividing the world into this, that, you, me, good, bad, black, white, da, da, da. We want people in power who are practiced in making the next best decision out of the emerging, unexpected, living moment. And I'm just going to have one more share. I'm going to ask you to bring up the last slides. Okay, and next slide. This is my daughter's quote. Next slide, please. There she is. Always, always interested in the weapons, whether she's a boy or a girl. And next slide. Ta-da! Thank you so much. I'm complete. Thank you so much, Dr. Brambaum, for offering us such a profound uh, uh really uh, interesting exciting talk uh uh so no i think your talk really uh, exemplify uh the uh the, the soft skills the importance of soft skills like your eye contact you're always passionate when delivering the contents you you change in tones uh, and the speed of speech your body language, uh, no, all those exemplify the importance of soft skills. And we know there are some students here, graduate students, maybe undergrad students uh, in this space. Uh, and you know, for a lot of time, we, we try to emphasize those important soft skills. They are not soft, actually, they are very important because you want to engage your audience and you want your research, your finding, no matter how important it is, no matter how sophisticated your approach is, you have to make people understand and, and buy your argument. So uh, I, I would say that Dr. Brownbaugh's speech definitely brings this to a very high level. Um, so hopefully our audience, our graduate students may really learn from, from her a way of speech and delivery uh, it is, is, is really uh, very impressive. Uh, and uh, this is really a profound uh, and philosophical uh, topic. So uh, you know, my personal uh, experiences, you know, when I called, for example, the Bank of America, the Chase or uh, Amram, uh, and uh, uh, no, definitely the person handling uh, the car is going to be an AI chatbot, right? And, and what I say is, no, uh, uh, no uh, connect me to a representative or connect to me an agent. And if I are consistent, no, uh, using this frame several times, no, I will be connected to a human being. Uh, so, uh, so this is the trick I use you know, because I think I do need some human uh, connection. Uh, and, and that is the, the, the way that, that probably our human mind is uh, hardwired uh, to connect to a human being. Um, so, but this really uh, you know, bring a, a, a very interesting scenario that, uh, and it's also a question for Dr. Brombaugh, uh, that on the one hand, you mentioned about uh, we, we, we need a teamwork, we need diverse groups to, to constantly be involved uh, in the AI algorithms and try to bring unbiased or less biased contents, uh, uh, content generation. But on the other hand, we are also afraid of the, the uh, 
the the potential censoring uh, and also the uh, the you no know, we need to protect the, the, the freedom of speech for individuals. You no, know, I, I know there's definitely a very thin line there, you no, know, between you no know, over supervision and censoring versus you no know, uh, just that the, the 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 algorithm go wild. So what is your intake of that, and how we can really find those thin lines and, and no, making best of use of AI, uh, but not letting it go wild uh, in the loop. Um, I thank you for that question. And it actually, um, it, I'm gonna bring in uh, Francisca's question as well, because uh, the, the answer that I have, which is this, is this my little answer, um, it, it would actually apply to both of those. So I'm gonna read that other question as well. How can you convince companies to include these aspects into their decision-making and prioritize them over profit? And my answer is for both of those is actually the same or similar. And that is going back to like, the problems can't be solved from the place in which they're created. So we've defined this, this, this binary problem and the um, the solution is not going to be how do I say this? The solution is not going to be just doing more analysis. Obviously, you have to do the. I'm not. I'm not saying that the analysis doesn't have to happen. I'm saying that to step like to do all of that analysis and, and to get it all straight and ask the questions and then to be able to step away from it, literally like step away from it and cultivate, cultivate conscious breathing to start to become aware that there is a solution and I don't know what it is and I am creating a pathway for that to come through and then going to sleep, making sure that I'm taking care of my body. We, we bring in the practices that begin to access the answers that we can't find by just looking at the data. Not that looking at the data isn't important. Of course, we must, must, must do that. And then, and the reason that I'm connecting that with, with Francisca's question is that for me, the way that I help you know, the companies that I work with to, to begin to make a space for, to begin to create a space for making different kinds of decisions is that I, I actually work with leaders who already have some kind of an awareness that these mindfulness practices and self-awareness is that they're important and that they've worked in their own lives to make it better. Because then we can go in and sort of supercharge those spaces. You get it that it works, conscious leader. <laughs> so, so now let's, I, like, let's give you a whole bunch of tools to help you make your, like the, your follows in, in your place better. And that is, my, that is the answer. I, it's definitely not going to come from arguing about it. So that actually tees up beautifully um, what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, there's a receptiveness in these leaders that you're working with. They're coming to you to, to engage and to solve. But you have expertise and experience um, with people earlier in their lives. Um, I mean, they may be showing leadership skills, but that may not be leaders of industry yet, whether we're talking about your Washington University undergraduates, whether we're talking about um, you're a mom. I, I'm just curious uh, what you'd uh, share as examples of how you've cultivated the kind of thinking that you um, would like to encourage either in class time or in mom time. Uh, because I, I suspect we've got some educators and parents in the room that are hoping to, that our, our progeny and our mentees will be those thoughtful leaders. Oh, that's such a great question. So um, I, I've mentioned conscious breathing more than once, and there are many, many ways to learn to breathe consciously. Um, one, one super easy sort of trick that will activate the vagus nerve, which will counteract that fight flight in uh, that fight flight place in our bodies, is um, exhaling longer than you inhale. So taking a breath of six and exhaling with eight you are going, you are now a different context. You are no longer in a fear place. 
and you're now in a place where you're, you've accessed the intelligence of your body to become real. So, so I, it, it is important to practice these kinds of techniques um, like on your own, like add, like after you brush your teeth, take free conscious breaths. Um, so that in the moment when the teenager is confronting you and telling you what a bad mom you are, and you don't want to destroy the relationship, you don't want her to be hurt, and you know that your own like inner being is also being wounded, when all of those things are happening, you don't want to have to think, oh, wait a second, what's that thing I'm supposed to do? <laughs> you want to have that breath practice right there like feeling your feet on the ground, being fully present with what's going on in you, what's going on in the kid, what's going on in the relationship and not knowing, like, I don't know, but I know that this is hurtful to me. I know that this is hurtful to you. And communicating all of that in that sort of grounded way without minimizing anybody's reality, that's an example of something that saved my daughters and my relationship. Thank you. We have one more question in the chat from, um, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, Edmundo Acosta. And the question is, is very much kind of what we are discussing right now about the strategy and what are the things that we can improve upon. And the question here is, um, how can we review our non-binary spaces and, and use it as a tool to refine algorithmic answers? Oh. Um, and, and I will just say that, that what I am positing is not cause and effect. So I, I will not be able to say that these kinds of practices that I've just described, and this is just one tiny one, um, these kinds of practices are not going to say, do this, and then the end, it's not logical, right? So, so um, I, my answer to that is you want to and I would just start with breath, if, you, if nothing else. Like, like there are bazillions of, of different uh, videos on YouTube that you can access that will help you learn conscious breathing and that you can learn it and practice it. And that in itself, if you do nothing else, is going to make your biological body the tool to refine the algorithmic answers. Is that helpful? So I have another question, if you don't mind, <laughs> Dr. Rumbaugh. Uh, so no, no, thinking about how the AI works in today's society, that you no, know, we I think the majority of us would agree that you no, know, we need teamwork, we, we need careful deployment, uh, we need a diverse group working on the algorithm and providing unbiased data. We can do all that if given that we have enough resources uh, and consciousness. But well, no, down the road, we have to deploy uh, the AI algorithm, the model to the wild. And then it's really up to the, uh, to the users uh, that how they are going to train the model and provide you know, uh, updates of data feed into the model and the model learn from that, right? So it, it would be uh, uh, the, the model uh, won't improve itself you know, without taking the most up-to-date data feed by uh, the, the, the users. On the other hand, well, we can't simply naively assume that users are unbiased because, well, we know our human beings are biased. Uh, and that is the reason why your example that the Tay uh, you know, uh, was shut down in 24 hours is not because the researchers fault, it's because the users are feeding uh, those, uh, those biased data uh, in a tremendous amount to the AI system. So uh, when, when we really employ, deploy the, the AI system, we have really uh, no uh, less control uh, of, of how the system works because you know, the users will be taking the lead. And, and how uh, what we can do to minimize the risk uh, of AI uh, after deployment. Um, and, and again, I am, I am approaching this from the way that I, that I use these tools um, for myself. So it's not linear. Um, this, this particular question, what can I control and what can I not control is key to being a conscious human being. If I, and I literally, like I would invite people if they really wanna play with this because my biological body has an intelligence that is not binary. And so you can literally stand in one space and say, this is what I can control. 
I've done my work. I've like, I have brought all the tools to the table that I know how to, and I am ready to put this out into the world. Over here, this is the box that I literally can't control. I do not know how it will be received and how does that feel? Um, and then as, as people start to cultivate their own inner wisdom and guidance and so on, um, that is the place from which I believe that we will make better decisions and then also feel less anxiety and overreach because we can't control what we can't control. Thank you. So, um, you know, there's one question that did come up in my mind while I was, um, you know, listening to your wonderful lecture. And it's really about, um, I was thinking about the transparency strategy that you had mentioned in one of your slides. And I'm really curious, like how can we create safe and transparent spaces where we can talk about the mistakes that have been made in, in our you know, AI attempts and um, so that we can really learn from them instead of being punished for the mistake that has been made? Oh my gosh, this is a huge and good and important question. And this is literally like, this is the space where you bring in people like me into an organization and we work with, we work with it with, um, with biological tools because the fact is that it does, like that punishing place for past mistakes does no good. What we can control is whether or not we can fix it. What we can't control is that it's already happened. And so bringing um, like really deep emotional intelligence tools into, um, into self-forgiveness, self-compassion. Like we don't know what we didn't know until we know it. And, um, and then we might get judged, we might get bombarded, we might like all kinds of bad things can happen. And still, most of it is beyond our control. And so we stay in the space where, uh, where we, where we have some ability to control and to work with and respond to. Thanks for that. Um, we have time for just one more question. Uh, our hour together is rapidly coming to a close, but it occurs to me, we, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about the problems of AI. That was the title of the talk. But my, my guess is you would not have thought about this so deeply if you weren't also excited by some of the possibilities. So, I love Gmail priority inbox. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> I'm serious. So, so maybe that is what you would answer this question, but I just would say whether it's what you're most excited about or something that you are excited about, we've talked about some things truly horrific. I mean, I'm thinking about people dying of heart attacks because of algorithms that devalue who they are in their experience, and that is awful. But on the better side of things, what's something good that we can um, I mean, and Gmail inbox, maybe one. <laughs> like like the, that, that particular tool is amazing. Um, and I, I, that, and that's the, I, I'm trying to, um, I, it's so funny because AI is so much everywhere now. Okay, here's another example. I am ambivalent about face recognition, but when I went into my Amazon photo account and I saw that I could, click on people and every picture of my daughter popped up and I could choose the ones that were going to be appropriate for this talk. I went, oh, thank you, facial recognition. So, um, so I think, I mean, this is where I just go back, like AI is neither good nor bad. It just isn't. Um, and, and so I think that I appreciate, I, I'm almost about to cry actually, like I really appreciate the ways that AI has made my life simpler and manageable in a very complex world because I, I have a brain that just like doesn't like organization and doesn't, it, it pops into all kinds of distractions and AI has helped me tremendously. Like Callan, it, a lot, there's a lot that I love and appreciate about how it makes my life easier and it's just a tool. And so I, I encourage us all to use it consciously. <laughs> Which may actually be nearly what you would want to say as closing thoughts, but we try to give our speakers a chance to leave the audience with a, a closing thought or a call to action or 
Um, just anything that you want to be the last thing they remember from this program today. I would say that in practical terms, if you're excited about this basic human truth and you want to work with it, then allow yourself the time and the patience and the grace to become that next conscious leader who is going to cultivate trust and transparency and emotional reality, as well as brilliance in your place. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, for spending the time with us today, Dr. Bramba, Rupang, and Smriti. Thank you so much for the collegial um, partnership that makes this program possible to our audience. I know so many um, great comments and questions that we didn't get a chance to address, but uh, we certainly hope to see you back at our next program, either through Open Classroom or through this Artificial Intelligence and the Social Sciences series. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and please stay healthy and safe out there. Goodbye now. Thank you so much, everyone.